we are live now sir uh, good afternoon to all so we are going to start next session and the topic is on ultra thin thin and ultra thin white topping so we are, we are having a speaker dr abhijit cc he is a professor in highway engineering sir has got uh, 29 years of experience in highway field in that he worked in 20 years in more than 20 years in industries he has published various papers in reputed journal and conferences sir has got membership in irc ist he is a fellow member in institution of engineers then he was involved in various project in various positions like uh, chief engineering projects like that so on behalf of department i welcome sir to give a talk on thin and ultra thin uh, white topping sir over to you sir thank you mr vivek das thank you sir hope my screen is visible and yes, sir. Uh, it's fine yes, it's fine yes. i am audible yes sir okay uh since morning there was uh, 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 a long uh, uh, discussions which were happening regarding rigid pavement and flexible pavement uh, ramchandra sir and uh, professor kiran kumar shared their uh, vast experience in uh, their fields of uh, rigid pavement and uh, the flexible pavement now i am trying to uh, uh, say some things about uh, thin and ultra thin white topping Presently, um, I mean, there is a lot of news going around regarding this thin white topping. Ultra thin is yet to come into into India, so I mean, they're still in an experimental stage, and uh, uh, it's not been uh, so widely adopted. But thin white topping has already been, I mean, it's already being used, and it is being widely adopted in most of the places. So. to throw a light on what is this thin white topping and some introduction to ultra thin white topping also so that i am trying to deal in this particular session so first of all uh, i would like to acknowledge uh, our professor so cg justo sir and uh, khanna sir and dr ria viragun sir also so because uh, their books have uh, given us a lot of information a lot of ideas initially to start with our career in this uh, highway engineering so not to forget uh, kadiyali sir so and apart from that i have used some some information from codes both in irc and is codes uh, nptel course materials some example which was there in that i have taken it and other uh, uh, extracts from some of the internet basically the pictures so what i try to project in this particular session okay so first of all uh, before starting about this one uh we'll have to understand what is white topping so is it same as rigid pavement so what is the difference so by definition it definitely says that uh, providing a portland cement concrete overlay on an existing bituminous pavement so if i do that then that can be called as white topping so the main principal purpose i is either to restore restore or increase the load carrying capacity or both so if the existing pavement has got deteriorated then we are supposed to strengthen it by providing a overlay so conventionally all these years it was a pro it was almost like a rule or a policy that a flexible pavement is always rehabilitated with only flexible pavements and not with rigid pavements or white topping or concrete topping so now from 2016 onwards in karnataka state especially in bangalore 2016 17 karnataka state government approved about uh, uh, 800 kilometers sorry 100 kilometers of road for this thin white topping costing about 800 crores and the work is still in progress and many of us who are in bangalore uh, know what are the hiccups what they are facing and uh, what are the difficulties the commuters are facing and all those things so let us keep that apart i mean that may be some political issues which may be involved so let us not get into so thin white topping as by definition as i already told you it is definitely a portland cement concrete overlay which is provided over a existing bituminous pavement that is existing flexible pavement 
so how is it different from conventional rigid pavement so conventional rigid pavement normally has a subgrade which is existing it may have a sub base or a base course or if the subgrade sub subgrade is sufficiently good then directly we can go and put a surface course with the concrete which is having thickness greater than 200 mm so then uh, normally what happens while providing that particular concrete layer so the the possibility of percolation of the cementitious material or the cement gel through the soil will occur to avoid that normally a separation membrane of about 125 micron thick plastic sheeting will be provided before providing the rigid concrete i mean the concrete overlay or the concrete surface course in in case of rigid pavement so that plastic separation membrane will act i mean it will definitely hold back the cementitious material without allowing it to percolate through the ground and also what it will do is in case of seasonal variation of temperature there is certain movement of pavement that is going to happen because of which there will be some frictional stresses that will get induced and because of this plastic membrane the frictional stresses will get reduced considerably so for these particular factors this uh, uh, plastic membrane will be provided which separates whether you have a base course or not so it definitely separates the underlying layer from getting in contact directly with the concrete pavement so then what is this white topping going to do so how is it different from the rigid pavement as i told you earlier itself this white topping is a concrete surface which is laid on an existing bituminous pavement so this overlay will be normally laid once we understand that the existing bituminous pavement has undergone distresses so if it is showing so exhibiting some distresses like cracking or rutting or any other type of distresses which are which are seen which is hampering the riding quality of that particular surface then we normally say that a rehabilitation is required so that the load carrying capacity of the road can be revived so in such cases the white topping is provided so usual process of providing this white topping is if there are any distresses on the pavement normally the, those distresses have to be patched either either by providing a patching like i mean if there is a pothole the pothole has to be filled if there are any other distresses like localized ones which may be rutting partial rutting or something like that so then a milling operation can also be done to remove those surface distresses so after removing those distresses the concrete pavement is laid which is normally called as white topping so this is the definite figure which most of the bangaloreans would have seen it so in some of the carriage ways wherein i mean some of the roads wherein the white topping work is in progress so in this case you can definitely see half of the portion of the road the white topping work has been completed and the other half portion is yet to be done so these 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 are the views which we can normally see and the thickness of the pavement can also be seen here so it is not more than 200 mm and you can see some black lines on the top which definitely says that there are some saw cuts which are made at very closer intervals so these things are not normally seen on a rigid pavement rigid pavement do have some longitudinal joints and transverse joints which may be about 3 and 1/2 to 4 3.5 meters to 4.5 meters distances so but here you can definitely see that i mean the scooter can be a reference which with which you can definitely see that the transverse joints are cut at much closer intervals so coming to the classification is this as i told you initially itself the i like to throw some light on ultra thin white topping also so whenever i'm discussing thin white topping so the concrete overlay of thickness is equal to or less than 100 mm if that is laid then we call that as ultra thin white topping if the thickness of the concrete overlay is greater than 100 mm but less than 200 mm then we call that as thin white topping the conventional white topping or the rigid pavement normally the thickness of these pavements will be much greater than 200 mm so whenever we think of rehabilitating a a, a a pavement so what are the alternatives what we have 
so if i have a bituminous pavement normally a bituminous overlay will be provided in most of the cases so the type of overlays if you want to understand there may be a bituminous overlay on an existing bituminous pavement there may be a bituminous overlay on a cement concrete pavement an earlier concrete road which was constructed as uh, professor uh, uh, as uh, uh, ramchandra sir was telling that bangalore mysore road was constructed with cement concrete pavement so if some stretches of roads which are there which are existing which wherein the rigid concrete pavements have been constructed long time back so and if that has to be rehabilitated because of certain reasons probably maybe the lack of friction or too much of cracking in such cases we may propose some bituminous overlays on that also so in this case uh, i am concentrating more on the cement concrete overlay on bituminous pavements so this is where i mean this thin concrete i mean thin white topping comes into existence so that's why i have highlighted that wherein i say that cement concrete overlay on an existing bituminous pavement which has certain amount of distresses and which needs to be rehabilitated and the other one may be a cement concrete overlay on a concrete pavement itself the existing concrete pavement has got distress so probably we may think of providing another cement concrete overlay on that so that may be another alternative which may be thought about so in this session i am discussing about thin white topping so where and i'll be concentrating more on cement concrete overlay on bituminous pavement only so just to take a, a, a typical uh, understanding just to get a bit, uh, understanding of what should be the thickness and how is it going to influence the performance of this white topping so we will have to understand some design principles or design methodologies what we are going to use are the factors which are going to affect the design of these overlays so design of overlays whenever we are trying to do so initially we will have to find out the structural strength or structural stability of the existing pavement so measurement or and estimation of strength of an existing pavement has to be done so that is basically the structural strength and usually it is carried out either by doing a bvd studies which is the benkelman beam studies or it can be a falling by deflectometer or any other methods that can be adopted popularly in india we we still rely on benkelman beams and the falling by deflectometers have come into existence in the recent past apart from that we will have to think about the design life of the overlaid pavement so what is the design life we are trying to Uh, consider whenever we want to design this uh, overlays so usually for flexible pavement it will be taken as 15 years and uh, normally it is seen that none of these pavements do exist a flexible overlays will uh, will serve for 15 years because of many reasons maybe because of the poor quality of construction or uh, 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 not better understanding or not providing the right thicknesses whatever it is required so due to many other reasons like that normally the bituminous pavements will not last for the design periods which we normally say it has to last for 15 years but whereas the rigid pavements what we have seen i mean it will be designed for a 30 years lifetime and it has been observed or seen that their design lives are much better when compared to the flexible pavement we will also have to consider the traffic load that is coming so which is not the present traffic it has to be the projected traffic during the design period so estimation of traffic to be carried out by the uh, i mean uh, uh, for the overlaid period so what were the overlaying period i mean if you are designing it for 15 years what would be the traffic that's going to come what is the reputation of load that is going to come those things have to be considered and irc has given us a definite procedure for doing that whether if it is a flexible pavement or a flexible overlay or a rigid overlay so and uh, we will have to determine the thickness and type of overlay so we will have to after doing these analysis or considering these factors we will have to do the uh, uh, designing and find out what should be the thickness of the overlay that has to be provided and the type of overlay so whether we are sticking to bituminous overlay or we are trying to work on some other type of overlay in this particular case if you are thinking about the concrete overlay so to understand this a typical example i would like to uh, give here so uh, i mean there are many methods uh, one is the benkelman beam method of design of overlay and the other one is the effective thickness method i am considering the i mean i am trying to work this i mean i am trying to explain this uh, particular thin white topping uh, thickness design based on uh, this uh, effective thickness method because 
this gives a more appropriate explanation. That's what I felt. So that's why I'm trying to give it. So effective thickness method, what are we going to do? How, how is it going to be adapted? So what we do is we will try to evaluate the existing condition of the pavement. And next, what we do is if that we'll forget that pavement which is existing there and try designing a new pavement on that particular stretch, considering the wheel load factors that is coming or the axle loads that is coming into that particular pavement and try determining the thickness. So comparing these two thicknesses, we can always determine what should be the overlay that has to be laid. So that's why in this effective thickness method, the basic concept this says that thickness of overlay is the difference between the thickness required for the new pavement and the effective thickness of the existing pavement. I cannot consider the actual thicknesses of different layers of the existing pavement basically because they do not possess the required strength and stability as a new pavement. So they would have undergone a lot of stresses because of which they might have lost some of their properties of load carrying or they may not be so efficient in carrying the loads that are coming on the pavement. So that's why it says that it has to be an effective thickness of the existing pavement. So by formulation, it can be said that thickness of overlay HO is equal to HN minus HE. So HN is nothing but the thickness of the new pavement minus HE, where HE happens to be the effective thickness of the existing pavement. It is not the actual thickness, the effective thickness. So how do we get that? So in this effective thickness method, all thicknesses of new and existing material must be converted into an equivalent thickness of bituminous concrete. So most of us who understand the design of uh, overlays, we definitely say that the final thickness, what we get is equivalent to the thickness of, I mean, we get that in the equivalence of bituminous concrete only. So based on that, we can say HE, that is the effective thickness that has to be provided, which has to be equal to, I mean, effective thickness of the existing pavement is equal to H1C1 plus H2C2 plus H3C3, so on, depending upon the number of layers. So where H1, H2, H3 happens to be the thickness of each layer and C1, C2, C3 will become the conversion factors of each layer. So based on the uh, strength characteristics of those particular uh, uh, layers, so Asphalt Institute has given us some conversion factors. So for subgrade, the conversion factor is given as zero. For granular subbase, which is reasonably well-graded hard aggregates with some plastic fines and CBR not less than 20%, use the upper part of the range if PI is less than six, lower part of the range if PI is more than six, because most of the roads which we are considering, I mean, which we normally discuss in this particular one, wherein a overlay has to be done, maybe a old road, which may be existing for past 15, 20 years or so. And at that particular time or moment, we never had wet mix macadam layers, which were being constructed only in the recent past, about past, past about 10 years, from past 10 to 11 years. I think probably if I'm right, I first saw it in 2009, so in that afterwards we started using the wet mix macadam but earlier to that it was always water bound macadam base course sub base courses which were normally seen so they do have some soil particles which will have certain plasticity indexes so we based on that the conversion factors have been given so in this particular case for the granular sub base it is given as 0.1 to 0.2 that means it is 0.1 times equivalent to bituminous concrete so that means if i say I'm supposed to put about 100 mm of, I mean, if I, if there is 100 mm of uh, uh, a granular subbase, so then equivalent to, uh, I mean, if equivalency of that with respect to the bituminous concrete, if I want to say it will be only about 10 mm of bituminous concrete. So that's how it has to be understood. So the strength is, this is only 0.1 to 0.2. Similarly, asphalt concrete surfaces and bases with uh, uh, that exhibit, uh, appreciable crack, cracking and crack patterns. I mean, if there are some very wide cracks and large number of cracked areas, if it is present, then it can be taken equivalent to 0.5 to 0.7. So that is based on the uh, amount of cracking that we normally observe in the existing bituminous pavement. Asphalt concrete surfaces and bases that exhibit some fine cracking 
have small intermittent cracking patterns and slight deformations on the wheel path, but remain stable. So, I mean, there is some flexible pavements which are there, which may, which wherein we may see some hairline cracks, which may be there. And along the wheel path, there may be certain amount of rutting, but not significant rutting. So in such cases, the equivalency factor can be taken as 0.7 to 0.9. So if if it is if if the amount of cracking is severe, then we can definitely say you can take it as 0.7. If the cracking is complete, I mean comparatively less, and if you don't find any observe any rutting in that, we can take it as 0.9. Similarly, asphalt concrete, including asphalt concrete base, generally uncracked and with little deformation in wheel path, can be taken as 0.9 to 1. So a good asphalt concrete then the equivalency factor of that can be taken as one so now using that using these particular things i mean if you just work out an example i have taken a typical example i mean i've not done any uh, serious calculations from some of some data which was available on the uh, net as a uh, uh, nptl course material so i've picked up that example for that for the explanation purpose so the existing pavement, if you say that, I mean, if it is having 250 mm of granular subbase, if it is having 250 mm of WBM, that's a water-bound macadam, 100 mm of BM and 40 mm of AC, that is asphalt concrete or bituminous concrete. So this is an existing one. So H1 can be taken as 250, H2 can be taken as 250, H3 can be taken as 100, and H4 can be taken as 40 mm. These things have to be multiplied with conversion factors, which is C1, C2, C3. So based on the condition in which they are. So for example, if the GSB is in sufficiently good condition, according to the conversion table, it definitely says that the granular subbase can be taken as 0.1 to 0.2. So if it is in good condition, I can take it as 0.2. If it is not in that good condition, I can say it can be taken as 0.1, similar to that. So similarly, Similarly, 100 mm BM and 40 mm AC also can be given some conversion factors. So based on those conversion factors, I can actually determine the effective thickness of the existing pavement. So effective thickness of the existing pavement. Similarly, the proposed thickness based on the, uh, uh, the uh, wheel load that is coming on that based on the design period, what we have considered. So there is a proposal that, I mean, the design values have come out something like this. So it's a typical example. I'm not uh, saying that it's for a particular road or any such things. So if you get it as 300 mm GSB, 250 mm of wet mix macadam and 100 mm of DBM, which is a dense bituminous macadam and 40 mm of AC that has to be provided. So then, whatever the difference i get from h naught and h e will be i mean uh, uh, the new payment h n minus of h e will give me the overlay thickness so the calculations can be done in this manner condition of the old payment layer gsb and wbm layers are in good condition with plasticity index of fines more than six considering that so the conversion factor for the existing pavement has to be taken as 0.1. Bituminous layer conversion factor, if I take it as 0.5, and asphalt concrete layer with appreciable uh, uh, cracking, the conversion factor, if it is taken as 0.6, then the effective thickness of the old pavement. So as it is given, HE is equal to H1, C1 plus H2, C2 plus H3, C3. If I do that, I get a value of about 124 millimeters of bituminous concrete. I get the effective thickness as 124 millimeters of bituminous concrete. Getting into the new pavement. So what happens to the new pavement? So equivalent thickness of the new pavement in terms of asphalt concrete or bituminous concrete, if I do that, then HN is equal to 300 plus 250 into 0.2 so the calculation similar to that as h1 c1 plus h2 c2 so if i do that i get a thickness of 250 millimeters so this 250 millimeters of bituminous concrete or asphalt concrete has to be provided so the existing one the effective thickness what i have got now is 124 millimeters so what would be the overlay thickness the thickness of the overlay 
would be equal to hn minus of he which is the which is 250 minus of 124 which is equal to 126 millimeters of bituminous concrete since dbm and bituminous concrete will have the same equivalency factor so we can provide 90 mm we can provide 90 mm dense bituminous macadam plus 40 mm ac as a overlay or a bituminous concrete as a overlay so this is an example now if 126 millimeters of asphalt concrete if i replace it with cement concrete if I replace it with cement concrete, 126 millimeters of bituminous concrete, if I replace it by 126 or 130 millimeters, so finally we are providing 90 plus 40, 130, rounding it off to 130 if I say. So 130 millimeters of bituminous concrete, if I replace it with 130 millimeters of cement concrete, pavement quality concrete of grade M40 or above, then what will happen to the performance of the pavement system? So if I consider the Engs models of bituminous concrete and compare it with cement concrete of M40 grade, it is almost 10 times higher. So the cement concrete Engs models is 10 times higher. For example, the normal asphalt concrete or the bituminous concrete, what we use, so according to the literatures, we have seen that the Engs modulus will be in a range of about 400 newtons per millimeter square to 4,000 newtons per millimeter square. So basically because they are temperature dependent, so they do vary in a significant manner because of the variation in temperature because bitumen has, is a viscoelastic material and it is definitely dependent on temperature. The elastic viscosity is definitely dependent on temperature. So hence, the Engs modulus of this bituminous concrete also varies significantly and according to the literatures, it has been seen roughly, it varies between around 400 to 4000. But whereas, if I switch that with cement concrete, if I compare it with cement concrete and if I say that the pavement quality concrete of M40 grade, if I'm going to use it and if I'm going to provide the same thickness here, then the Engs modulus of that would be around 4 I mean, 40,000 newtons per millimeter square, which is almost 10 times greater than the uh, 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 the uh, bituminous concrete Engs modulus. So this is one thing which has played an important role in deciding the thickness of the bituminous concrete overlays, which we call it as thin white topping overlays. So if I mean, definitely it is understandably a much better material when compared to the bituminous, uh, 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 I mean, uh, bituminous concrete. When, uh, when if we consider the load carrying capacity or the compressive strength or the bending stresses that get, uh, get into those particular places, all these things, the load distribution factors, any of those parameters if you consider, so then definitely bituminous concrete would be, I mean, uh, the uh, cement concrete would definitely fare much better than the asphalt concrete or the bituminous concrete. So this is where it actually comes into picture. I mean, it is not that we are trying to debate which is good or which is bad. So, but this, this example, I'm trying to give it basically because, I mean, it gives us some picture of the thickness design of an overlay. So that 126 millimeters or 130 millimeters of bituminous concrete, if I say that I'm going to do it with 130 millimeters of cement concrete, then what would be the performance of the pavement. So that's where it actually lies. In. Okay, so now whenever we think of any rehabilitation measures, so what are the factors that are going to influence when, what, uh, for this rehabilitation of this existing pavement? So first and the foremost factor would definitely be the projected traffic loading. What is the type of traffic and what is the amount of wheel load or the, what is the wheel stress, wheel load stresses that's going to come out of the pavement. So that plays a very important role. And it also tells us more about, I mean, we'll have to understand the existing pavement system, which is there, what is its condition, what are the layer thickness and drainage, uh, drainage uh, uh, condition of that particular pavement. Most of the urban roads, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, this thin pavements, thin white toppings, which are now being used very widely on urban roads rather than going into the rural roads. So I'm trying to still stick on to the urban roads, basically because of certain factors uh, as, as comparable to flexible pavement. I also uh, say that, I mean, I stand with uh, Kiran sir, wherein he said that 
I mean, uh, the flexible payment systems are the best possible systems for giving us a better riding quality if it is done in a if it is done and maintained in a proper condition. Yes, because they don't have any joints, so then definitely the riding quality uh, would be much better when compared to the cement concrete pavements riding quality. So there is certain noise which normally gets produced in the rigid pavements or in the thin white toppings, which will not be there on the flexible pavement. So I'm not going to get into that uh, particular uh, uh, this discussion, but I'm trying to say where we can use this. So where we can use this. So the existing pavement system in the urban roads, what would have happened is because these roads have been existing for a long duration of time and they are subjected to repeated wheel loads, then definitely the base or the foundation of these particular roads would have got compacted into a much better manner than any of the new roads which we try to construct. So the failures which are going to see, which will be seen on these particular payments are normally only the surface failures, not the base failures. So that means they would have failed functionally in most of the cases and not structurally. So in such cases, this, I mean, these things have normally been observed because of the adverse weather conditions and maybe because of the repeated wheel loading on a specified path and also because of the reason that the maintenance is not done in a proper periodic timing at or a proper timing so these things will definitely have uh, uh, deteriorated the condition of the existing equipment another major factor is the cost so what would be the cost of the overlay so overlay construction cost whenever we think about it normally it is understandable that uh, Initially, putting a larger sum of money to overlay a particular carriage bay to a best possible standard probably will not be allowed by the government because of the funds constraints. And normally, they try to put it on stage-wise developments. So if the pavement thickness for next 15 years, if I get it as 150 millimeters of BC, they would say that, OK, I mean, why you want to take the traffic after 15 years? So put it for 10 years and bring it down to 100 mm. So this is what normally happens. And because of that, the pavements which are rehabilitated will not last for the whole time. So in such cases, the overlay constructions with bituminous pavements will fail. And even though they are economical, they do not perform in the rightful manner. And also the life cycle cost will also have a significant effect. So bituminous pavements life cycle cost, if I'm going to compare with the cement concrete life cycle cost, that is basically the thin white topping, life cycle cost definitely the the life cycle cost of the concrete payments that is the thin white toppings will be very much lesser when compared to the bituminous overlays user delay cost also in cases even though we say that this thin white topping whenever it is being laid so we are not going to allow the traffic for 28 days i mean because the curing has to get completed it has to attain the flexural strength of about 7 newtons per millimeter square before i allow the vehicle to come on that. So in such cases, definitely there is a certain amount of delay that will be, I mean, the user delay cost will be slightly significant at the initial phases, but not that significant when we consider the life cycle cost. The vehicle operation cost also because of the delay, the operation cost during the construction time will be slightly higher. But once it is constructed, then naturally it is it doesn't require any maintenance or repair for the next 30 years. So, and in that constraint, if you consider the vehicle operation cost on the thin overlays, I mean, thin white toppings will definitely be much lesser. The time factor is another one. So, a number of construction operations, total construction time, repair and maintenance time, initial performance period, all these things, if you are going to consider. So, as I said earlier, the rigid pavement, I mean, the thin white topping construction, the construction operation is slightly a slower process. It cannot be done as fast as the bituminous overlay construction. So initial construction time will be more, but since it doesn't, it will not have, I mean, it will not require any repair and maintenance time, which is periodically, it has to be done on flexible pavement. Hence the overall time factor, uh, thin white topping would be much more beneficial. The corridor impact comparatively, I mean, considering the noise level, excess pollution level, accident rate, ride quality. So all these things, if you are going to consider. So in some of the factors, yes, it is debatable saying that, I mean, the flexible payment gives us a better ride quality. So the noise levels are lesser. So 
these things are these particular constraint these particular factors probably the flexible payments may get uh, upper hand but if i consider the entire lifetime period lifetime period the right quality of the concrete payments or the thin white toppings will be much better because it does not require any periodical maintenance so hence the riding right quality will be uniform throughout its life so that's one advantage noise level i mean if you are considering the urban roads and which is getting thin white top then naturally the running speed of the vehicle is comparatively less so hence the noise levels will not be that much different when compared to the flexible overlays pollution levels also because i mean the concrete white topping even though the cement manufacturing may cost a certain amount of pollution but the construction during the construction process there is no pollution at all because there is nothing burnt in that particular area so hence there is no uh, pollution i mean apart from i mean apart from some trucks which are going to come down to deliver the concrete so there is no other uh, uh, other carbon dioxide that is getting emitted during the process of the construction of uh, uh, of the pavement so that is a thin white topping so accident rates yes i mean the bad roads leads to a lot of accidents so i mean if you are having a better road then naturally the accident rates are comparatively less so the, if there are no potholes so there are no depressions there are no unseen uh, uh, shear failures which are going to be seen on these flexible pavements so if those things are not there probably the accident rates will definitely be lesser the next factor is material availability so cement bituminous binder aggregate so i mean uh, uh, the cement is much more easily available because the crude crude oil or the petroleum products which has to be uh, uh, imported from elsewhere so so the cement is manufactured in india and it is widely available so contractors also i mean whether to have the they i mean whether they have the ability or the capacity to construct the concrete pavements as per the required standard so that's another one and if, do they have experience and if, do they, is there a competition because competition brings down the prices to a uh, uh, better i mean uh, uh, market prices will come down so that's another factor so all these factors when we consider so we'll have to think about this our particular alternate of thin white topping so i'll just trying to list out the advantages and disadvantages of thin white topping i'm not comparing it with uh, uh, any other type, other alternative so so this is the, some of the advantages so it does have a longer life because we normally design it for 30 to 40 years uh, hence it is a sustainable solution so since you are not going to maintain i mean the aggregates will not be reused and the aggregates whatever has been used so it will last for 20 to 30 years and later on also that concrete can be broken and reused so recycling of that aggregate is also possible so hence it becomes a sustainable solution so fuel saving up to 14% as 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 it can be understood this is from the literature what we have seen because once we uh, once the road doesn't require any maintenance so for about 30 to 40 years so then naturally there is a 14% of uh, fuel saving so pollution free construction I, as i said so the concrete in the process of construction in thin construction of thin top, thin white topping so i am not going to make use of any i mean i'm not going to burn any diesel or any such things so which is very much required in case of uh, hot mix asphalts so that is the hma pavements or the bituminous concrete constructions require less as less maintenance so no frequent traffic interruption so i mean in the process of initial process of construction there may be some traffic interruptions but for the next 30 40 years so you don't find those interruptions to be there on those particular roads good riding quality throughout its life so i mean there is no potholes or cracks that gets formed so frequently so which is going to uh, reduce the riding quality so hence that gives a better riding quality faster vehicle movement and reduced travel time reduce running cost so so the roads are good normally the traffic will move at a brisk pace then naturally it reduces the travel time it also reduces the running cost so it does have some i mean when compared to the uh, bituminous pavements uh, which gets smoothened similarly the thin white toppings also do get smoothened but even then it is understood that it gives a better skid resistance so all weathers so i mean even in, during the rainy season because the water doesn't uh, stand on those particular pavements or uh, the uh, the water will get drained off very fast on these uh, thin white toppings because of the proper camber or the uh, drainage uh, drainage facilities that has been provided hence naturally the skid resistance will be much better and it will be a all uh, during all weathers and all conditions so the pavement the skid resistance will be better
so can withstand extreme uh, weather conditions and probably as we have seen that i mean the flexible pavements whenever it rains heavily or i mean if there is certain amount of flooding that occurs then naturally the pavement gets inundated in water so the pavements will not last for a longer duration of time so other uh, functional uh, uh, advantages is uh, i mean because of the color so it gives a better light reflection hence the road is much better visible during night time so which will improve the safety so lower demand of external lighting so the street lights which have to be provided will also i mean we may think of spacing them at longer distances or the wattages of the uh, luminescence of the bulbs that have been provided can be reduced so we don't need such bright lights that has to be provided so i mean we definitely know that uh, the black body radiation i mean any black surface takes up a lot of heat so i mean instead of providing the asphaltic pavements or the bituminous pavements which are black in color so if you provide any other pavement with a different color so then naturally it gives a better cooling effect so a cooling effect owing to lower absorption of solar energy with environmental benefits can be considered in this thin white topping so better usage of natural aggregates as i said these natural aggregates once if it gets into concrete and if it is spread as thin white topping it's going to be there for 30 to 40 years and even after that i mean if i if the concrete pavement fails then we can actually crush it and make use of the aggregates in a certain proportion then naturally it can be used as i mean reused as an aggregate for the concrete so that's another one which can be done so apart from that i mean there is certain amount of fuel spillages which may normally happen on the roads and uh, the flexible pavements since these vitamins are going to be soluble in the uh, uh, petroleum products so then naturally the fuel spillage will hamper uh, i mean will damage the flexible pavements to a great extent but in case of rigid pavements these concrete pavements will not have any effect i mean it will not get affected by these fuel spillages so coming to the disadvantages yes i mean i can't discuss only the advantages disadvantages are also there so the first and the foremost thing is the initial cost is high so probably i mean if we consider the thicknesses of the thin white topping which will be provided at present at present the thicknesses are much higher than whatever the bituminous concrete overlays that will be provided due to some reasons the safety issues are to be to to i mean because they are they are allowed to be designed for 30 years and uh, i mean considering the 30 years of traffic growth whereas the bituminous overlays are designed for 15 years traffic growth so then naturally the thickness worth has to be provided in case of uh, thin white topping would be much higher than the bituminous concrete hence the initial investment is higher transverse and longitudinal joints are unavoidable so this is where the bituminous concrete beats us or beats the thin white topping in a big manner because these joints are unavoidable in case of thin white topping whereas flexible pavements which are bituminous concrete pavements can be constructed without providing any joints so no longitudinal joints no transverse joints hence the riding quality of that road surfaces will be much better whenever we think of high speed roads so in case of urban areas wherein the vehicles do not travel at very high speeds so there is a restriction so then naturally in such places thin white topping can be used in a better manner so maintenance and repair if any are mostly related to the joints so i mean if there is any cracking that occurs in this rigid pavements or thin white topping i mean the full full depth repair has to be done so partial repairs cannot be done so i mean as we do it in case of flexible pavement i mean if there is a pothole the pothole can be patched and the road can be allowed to use so but in this cases it is not possible in that manner so that particular slab portion has to be cut and the full depth repair has to be made so hence it becomes slightly expensive and time consuming a minimum period of 28 days curing is required as i told you earlier the cement concrete takes up 28 days for curing so that's another thing so texture becomes smooth with use hence skid resistance reduces with age so so repeated usage or repeated wheel load application on the uh, thin white topping will lead to certain amount of reduction in uh, i mean smoothing of the uh, surface which will reduce the uh, i mean which will play an important role and it brings down the skid resistance of the pavement if the construction is spread for the full width of the road then normally what happens is i mean we will have to deviate the traffic entirely for 28 days so that's what it says construction is spread over the full width of the carriage where traffic should be diverted completely so this is some of the disadvantages 
so now discussing all these things about the advantages and disadvantages and uh, substantiating the thickness of the thin overlay now we'll have to understand what would be the fundamental behavior so what actually happens so what is uh, it's going to occur or i mean i mean the way it's going to actually perform when it is subjected to a wheel load so typically the first figure above which says about the unbonded overlay it is a typical uh, figure wherein a rigid concrete overlay is put on a base or it may be straight away on the subgrade or it may be a hma asphalt pavement itself so in this particular case the interface is normally having a plastic sheet that is a 125 micron plastic sheet which is normally provided so if it is provided um, and a rigid pavement is constructed on the top then if it is subjected to a wheel load if it undergoes deflection then the top member has got its own neutral axis and the bottom bituminous layer will have its own neutral axis because they slip because they slip so hence there is the i mean these two beams act in a different manner so this is one separate beam this is another separate beam so hence they have different cent uh, neutral axes so whenever we have a different neutral axis if i consider the top concrete layer so above the neutral axis of this one will have i mean that particular zone will have compressive stresses and below that will there will be tensile stresses so similarly in the bottom layer also above the neutral axis you have compressive and below you have the tensile stresses at the interface in this particular case you can see that the concrete layer is subjected to tensile stresses and bituminous layer is subjected to uh, compressive stresses whenever this happens then the concrete as we know is not good in taking up tensile stresses so the cracks may start developing at this particular interface and it may start coming to the top so from the bottom it starts coming out of the top so this is one thing which normally happens in most of the rigid pavements whenever they are subjected to heavy wheel loads repeated wheel loads coming to the thin white topping in thin white topping what we do is i mean there is no plastic sheet separation so it is a bonded layer so on the existing bituminous pavement directly the concrete is laid and it is cured so once we do that what happens is this this system works as a composite beam it acts as a composite beam with the top portion being concrete and the bottom portion being the bituminous layer so and if they get bonded properly then it acts as a composite beam and this entire beam will have one neutral axis and if that neutral axis comes to the bottom of this concrete layer then naturally the concrete is not subjected to any tensile stresses it is subjected to only compressive stresses so typical condition if it if this comes to the interface then naturally in this interface there is no compressive stress nor the tensile stresses that is going to be there so since there is no compressive or tensile stresses then naturally this particular system is going to last for a very long duration of time basically because it gets bonded properly and the tensile stresses go into the bituminous pavement and bituminous pavements are much better in withstanding the tensile stresses when compared to the concrete pavements and concrete pavement section takes up all the compressive loads that's going to be there so this is a typical picture which explains about the bonded and the unbonded thin white topping is a bonded overlay so thin white topping is definitely thin and ultra thin white toppings will be a bonded overlay whereas a rigid white topping will be a, a typical example of an unbonded overlay so since the time is less i'll try to run through this some of them so bending stresses in bonded composite beams so naturally whenever it gets bonded it can be seen if i put an equivalent section equivalent to the asphalt concrete the section area will become larger and hence the bituminous in in this composite section the neutral axis comes below the interface so the stress values whatever the bending stresses that's going to be there so then those bending stresses within the concrete will be comparatively less similarly the shear stress values also if based on the neutral axis so i mean in case you have two different different sketches wherein the neutral axis is gone below the interface if the pavement thickness the thin overlay thickness if you are going to provide is much thicker then probably the neutral axis may get into some portion into the concrete itself so in such cases there may be some shear stresses which may get developed in the uh, 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 uh in the uh, concrete uh, uh, section also so coming to the factors influencing the compressive strength and flexural strength of concrete so i mean we all understand i mean we know much better things of concrete so 
water cement ratio, the quality of cement and the quantity of cement and also the chemical constants, the aggregates, the water, so the type quality of water, the moisture content in the aggregate and the slum will and uh, the mineral admixtures what we use, uh, the super plasticizers what we nowadays use, degree of compaction what we execute in the site and the temperature at the time of laying, curing efficiency and curing temperature. So all these factors, we know that they have a significant impact on the flexural strength and also the compressive strength of the cement concrete. So similarly, the bond strength of the cement concrete. So because we say that this has to be a bonded uh, system, so if it has to act as a composite system means there has to be a proper bond between the thin white topping and the existing bituminous pavement. So that the effectiveness of that bond itself will have a significant effect on the performance of the overall performance of the thin white topping or the ultra thin white topping. So hence, this bond strength plays a very important role. Use of polypropylene fibers, which has been thought about in uh, using, which has been thought about uh, uh, to be an additive uh, to improve the flexural strength of the thin white topping concrete. So it, uh, I mean, the studies have shown that whenever we have this polypropylene fiber, so the bond strength of the cement concrete with the existing bituminous concrete will be slightly lesser because these polypropylene propylene fibers at the interface will reduce the bond strength. So it has got certain amount of disadvantages. So studies have shown it. Use of mineral admixtures like fly ash and micro silica, they develop a better bond. So I mean, these things, if you are using it, so I mean, in the concrete, it definitely has uh, improved uh, bond strength. So that's this, I mean, the studies have shown it. So elastic modulus of cement concrete, this is what I was telling you earlier. Basically, I mean, if the elastic modulus, if you're comparing it with the bituminous concrete, so it is almost 10 times or 10 times or more higher than the bituminous concrete. So the performance of thin white topping is also dependent on the elastic modulus. So uh, the white toppings which are having, I mean, white toppings which are constructed with cement concrete with higher elastic modulus, so can resist higher magnitude of load. So the wheel loads can be registered in a much better manner. So uh, addition of micro silica admixture uh, definitely increases the compressive strength. This, I mean, there is a lot of studies that have been carried out and uh, the effect of micro silica in the concrete has been said that, I mean, the compressive strength will definitely be higher and it significantly it will also increase the elastic modulus. Studies have also indicated the addition of admixtures uh, in suitable percentages increases the elastic modulus in cement concrete, whether it may be a fly ash or uh, 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 blast furnace slag or any of these ad admixtures what we try to do. So other factors what we can think about is uh, the compression due to bending of our M40 grade is about 13 newtons per millimeter square, so which is the permissible stress that is there. So whenever we, whenever it is subjected to any loading, so the, the uh, so stresses in stresses in the in the uh, in the in the compression of the uh, concrete section should never exceed 30 newtons per millimeter square. So the neutral axis within the cement concrete layer uh, uh, in thin white topping composite beams. So since it is going to be slightly near to the interface and it is going to be slightly in the uh, uh, concrete portion itself. So concrete below the neutral axis is subjected to tensile stresses because normally what happens in the design of these uh, thin white topping, as I told you, the wheel loads, what we are going to calculate for the design period of 30 to 40 years. So then naturally the wheel loads will be more and the thickness obtained will become slightly higher than what the thickness we get from the regular calculations as I showed for the bituminous concrete. So Tensile stresses in the extreme bottom fibers of the cement concrete in tensile is tensile in nature, and the permissible tensile values, I mean tensile stress values, is given as 4.4 newtons per millimeter square. If it is slightly above the interface, then normally the tensile stresses that are going to be there in the below the neutral axis in the uh, concrete section will never exceed this particular value of 4.4 newtons per millimeter square. So. Other factors are also there, uh, I mean, uh, uh, like uh, the modulus of elasticity, uh, uh, which is going to have a, a, a modulus of elasticity and the, the shear stress, or whatever is going to get developed are directly related. So they do have a linear relationship. I mean, if you have a better uh, modulus of elasticity, then this resistance to shear stress will also be comparatively better. So 
uh, effect of uh, warping stresses and frictional stresses in thin white topping. So, I mean, whenever we think of any concrete pavements design, so this is one of the significant factor which has to be considered. So the variation in temperature, which is the daily variation and the seasonal variation. So daily variation in temperature uh, uh, will have a significant effect and which will develop, I mean, which, uh, which will have a curling effect on the pavement and uh, which we call it as the warping stresses that will be uh, getting into the pavement. So the difference, this is basically caused basically because of the temperature difference between the top and the bottom fiber of this white topping. In case of thin white topping, as the thickness itself is less, so then naturally the variation of temperature between the top and the bottom fibers will be comparatively less when compared to rigid pavements which do have thicknesses greater than 200 mm. Here the thickness is comparatively less. So hence the, uh, uh, the warping stresses which gets developed in this particular case will be comparatively less. Apart from that, the seasonal variation which leads to expansion and contraction of uh, 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 the members which will develop some frictional stresses are also a significant factor which has to be considered whenever we think of designing the rigid pavement. But in this particular case of thin white topping or ultra thin white topping, what happens is the frictional stresses, whatever it gets developed is directly proportional to the length of the slab. So the length of the slab normally in case of rigid pavements, if it is about 4.5 meters length, even though we use a plastic sheeting, there is certain amount of frictional resistance that will get developed. And because of that, the frictional stresses will be there and hence, that has to be that will be a significant value but in this particular case of thin and ultra thin white topping what happens is if we say that it is totally bonded with the flexible pavement and the friction thus i mean there is a certain amount of friction that gets developed mm -hmm. but the joints what we are placing or joints which which will be cut are at, cut at very close intervals and since they are cut at very close intervals then the frictional stresses the magnitude of the frictional stresses that get developed will be significantly low. So that's a basic explanation which can be given for the warping stresses and the frictional stresses that are going to be there in the, uh, uh, in, the uh, in the white topping. So as I said, I mean, it's, uh, I mean uh, since the joints of thin white topping are placed at closer interval, the frictional stresses induced due to uniform temperature uh, in is negligible, negligibly far, small. Hence, the frictional stresses will not have any significant impact on the performance of thin white topping. So it doesn't have that uh, important. I mean, that will not, it will not have such significant effect. So I think I'll not go uh, much in detail uh, regarding this recommendations of construction and implementation. The mixed design, I mean, we have a tentative guide, guidelines from the IRC, which is given. So IRC SP 76 gives us uh, the tentative uh, guidelines for the design of uh, thin and ultra thin white topping. So people who are interested can get through those particular uh, uh, things. Only only thing which I would be interested to end I mean, before, before I end uh, end this one is uh, regarding the joints. So as I have been telling you that the joints will be uh, at closer intervals, which will be provided in case of thin white topping. So you can see the sockets because many of us travel in Bangalore on these white toppings. So it can be seen that the traditionally socketing technique will be used and one third the, the thickness of the white topping will be provided for longitudinal joints and the trans transverse joints will be having the depth of uh, socket which is equal to one by fourth of the thickness of the white topping. So this helps in concentrating the shrinkage cracks which gets developed. And coming to the uh, spacing of these joints, normally there is a rule. I mean, the literature have uh, told us that it can be taken as uh, 10 times the thickness of the proposed UTW, that is ultra thin white topping, or it can be taken as 12 to 15 times the thickness of the proposed thin white topping. So the joints have to be uh, sawed. I mean, the saw joints have to be cut with, based on these particular. So, however, uh, 600 mm can be considered as the minimum spacing of both longitudinal and transverse joints. So, this is the overall picture of thin white topping. Hopefully, I have uh, given a uh, uh, thrown a limelight onto this thin white topping. So, and uh, uh, according to my uh, understanding or the researches, what I have done and studies, what I have conducted, so it would be definitely a better alternative for an urban road wherein there is a significantly high number of vehicles. Uh, the volume is significantly high, so and the wheel loads are comparatively low. In such cases, probably this would be a much better alternative. Thank you.
Sir, uh, first of all, I thank uh, Abhijit sir for having a nice presentation. So, thank first time we are seeing the technical aspects of uh, thin and ultra thin uh, payments. So, sir has gone in details with respect to that. Thank you for that, sir. Sir, we will have some questions. Yes. So, first question is uh, from uh, Bharat Kushan Rampal. So, okay. he asked, what is the conversion factor of DBM? DBM, D, dense bituminous macadam and AC is taken equivalent to bituminous concrete 1. Conversion factor is 1. Okay. I mean, so, it is given in the table itself. According to the asphalt concrete, so anything above, uh, I mean, uh, dense bituminous macadam and uh, uh, the asphalt concrete, the conversion factor will stay as 1. Okay. Yeah. Our, uh, next question is, hmm. what is the life of white topping? The, the design life the design life is taken as 30 years so normally it is predicted between 30 to 40 years and it is expected to do well much beyond that i mean uh, uh, the experimental study says that it may last beyond 50 years also but the design life for the design aspects it is considered as 30 years okay thank you sir our next question is what is the minimum grade of concrete which is recommended for white topping? Pavement quality concrete, we normally say it has to be beyond, I mean, it, is, it should be greater than M40. M40 is the minimum grade proposed for thin white topping. So it cannot be lesser than that. Okay. Now, what is the size of uh, panel size for this white topping, whether it is similar to rigid pavement or any different system? No, no. I mean, uh, I, I think I'd explain, uh, lastly, I was telling you. So uh, here in this case, since it's a bonded overlay, so the, the cut section, the saw cuts, which has to be provided, it will be provided at much closer interval. So uh, the literatures, whatever uh, has been done, or the, I mean, the studies which has been conducted, they have given a thumb rule saying that for thin white topping it can be taken as 12 to 15 times the thickness 12 to 15 times the thickness so so that should be the distance between the sockets so it cannot be as 3.5 meters or 4.5 meters it cannot be at such long distances so here it will be normally seen around 1 meter 1.2 meter or something like that so i mean on the existing payments you can definitely see those sockets the uh, lo both longitudinal and transverse which are at much closer intervals okay thank you sir thank you thank sir, you over to prakash sir thank you abhijit sir it's very nice of you to have uh, you're given a fantastic uh, presentation with regard to thank you, sir. and uh, we are really uh, all, all, all this uh, many of the people have given a very thumbs up sign for you uh, just now oh. I received all that. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, sir. So it was always a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. No, sir. You can end the session.